reduce reliance on Russian energy, support Ukraine, and help the planet. We have a very impressive array of speakers this morning uh, to kick off our public discussion about the benefits of saving uh, energy savings by European citizens. We're also on a tight schedule um, for our hour-long uh, discussion, so I'll strive uh, to keep things moving. Um, before we start, I will um, uh, say that we are joined today in speaking order by uh, Ditte Jul Jorgensen, the Director General for Energy at the European Commission, by Fatih Birol, the Executive Director of the IEA, uh, by Mr. Claude Turmes, the Minister for Energy and Spatial Planning for Luxembourg, uh, Patrick Grecken, State Secretary at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action, uh, Leonor Gerseler, the Federal Minister for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation, and Technology for Austria, Mark Watts, Executive Director of C40, um, Monique Goyens, Director General of uh, BIUC, the European Consumers Organization, Sharon Burrow, the, Secretary, the General Secretary at the International Trade Union Confederation, and uh, shortly we will be also joined by Eamon Ryan, the Minister for the Environment, Climate and Communications uh, trans and Transport uh, of uh, Ireland. We'll hear from all of our speakers. And after that, we will have some uh, time for questions. We have many journalists uh, joining us on the Zoom this morning. Of course, uh, this is a live streamed um, uh, dis public discussion and the report is now available on our website at ia.org. So with that, uh, I would like to turn to Ms. Uh, Dite Jul Jorgensen for her introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jad, and good morning, uh, everyone. And thank you very much to you, uh, Fati and the International Fati Birol and the International Energy Agency, for all the work you have been doing also over these past months to help us reduce our reliance on Russian uh, fossil energy uh, and uh, and to save energy. We've actually been working in parallel in Brussels. We were working on Repower EU to reduce dependence, while you in Paris under the International Energy Agency. We're doing uh, analytical work to reduce uh, both that energy dependence, but also uh, specifically to save oil. Um, uh, Russian invasion into Ukraine, the Russian war in Ukraine is a human tragedy and a humanitarian disaster. And we're all looking at what can we do ourselves? What can we do professionally? And what can we do personally? And the one thing that everyone can do, that each of us can do individually at home and at work, is to uh, save energy. Um, it helps us save on the energy bill. It lowers the energy bill. It helps our climate by reducing uh, CO2 emissions. Um, and uh, it does help sustainability. And of course, it helps Ukraine via all of that. So in the European Union, we have adopted a Repower EU uh, strategy. And, and we'll set it out with a plan where we look at how do we reduce dependence on Russian fossil exports. And, and to give you one example, we import about 150 billion cubic meter of gas from Russia per year. We need to reduce that. Our European Green Deal, our Fit for 55 proposals make a significant contribution there already. We estimate that we can cut about 100 billion cubic meters by 2030 simply by doing what we're planning to do in accelerating and scaling up renewable energy uh, in energy efficiency measures to cut our consumption over time. Um, and, uh, and of course, we can cut by alternative supplies uh, of, uh, of gas and oil from other suppliers across the world. But the most effective measure and the absolutely necessary measure is energy savings. We can cut immediately uh, by saving energy. And that's where your work uh, is so important uh, in the International Energy Agency the action plan you have set out and the analysis underpinning it on how do we best save quickly and efficiently, again, both for our consumers, for the climate, um, and to reduce dependence on Russian exports uh, for Ukraine. And I'm very glad to be here with you this morning. This is not the end of a process. This is the beginning of a process, a further step to accelerate our work for energy savings. And it's also the beginning of a discussion to see what can we do better, each of it in each of us individually, but also what can we do better together. So I'm glad to be joined by consumers this morning, by cities, uh, by the trade unions, as well as by a number of ministers from across uh, the European Union who are personally engaged and have been pushing also for this important energy savings agenda, again, both as part of the Green Deal, but also to repower EU and reduce dependence on Russian uh, fossil exports. 
So with that, uh, back to you at the International Energy Agency. Thank you very much. Many thanks. Um, and I would like now to turn the floor to our executive director, uh, Dr. Bureau. Uh, thank you very much. And a very good morning uh, to all of you. <clears throat> um, uh, Dita, thank you very much for your leadership, uh, this uh, commission. Uh, very difficult days, very challenging days in Brussels to coordinate the response of uh, European uh, countries here. We are, uh, as I said several times, at your disposal to support uh, the Commission's uh, actions, plans, and strategies to um, uh, reduce, if not nullify, Russian energy. I wouldn't say Russian uh, fossil energy. I would say Russian energy. I don't want to get even a clean energy from Russia. So I would say Russian energy, we don't want it. So, uh, dear colleagues, uh, we are, uh, in my view, uh, in the first global energy crisis. And it looks like that this uh, crisis may be with us for some time to come. Not only weeks, but months, it may take longer because uh, Russia has been years and years the number one oil exporter of the world and number one natural gas exporter of the world. So what are we going to do? especially in uh, Europe is uh, critical because uh, many governments, rightly so, talking with different uh, producers of oil and natural gas to replace the Russian oil and gas. But to be honest with you, even in terms of gas, if we have the LNG import capacity 100% working, which is a big, big, big challenge, 100% maximum capacity, we still need substantial amount of gas to replace uh, the our uh, storage. So it will be still, the winter will be difficult. So in my view, we have two in the next uh, one year, we have two important uh, dates. One, in terms of oil, this summer, when the driving season in the world starts. And in terms of natural gas, this winter, when the heating season starts. Many, as I said, many countries are looking at the additional supplies, production coming here and there. But in my view, we may be left with the choice of either governments utilities will have to ration themselves, cut the energy to the consumers, or we do it ourselves and using pushing the energy efficiency button. So this is the reason a uh, International Energy Agency came up only one week after the Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine with a 10 point plan in terms of uh, natural gas, what we can do and followed by an, an oil 10-point uh, uh, plan. And the important thing is, uh, dear colleagues, uh, the suggestions we have, they are practical, easy to implement suggestions, and they have been again and again uh, implemented in different contexts to reduce air pollution, congestion, or uh, like uh, in the past uh, to uh, save oil in the 1970s, we have uh, uh, already uh, uh, seen uh, such uh, examples. So they don't come completely uh, out of uh, blue. And uh, it is the reason we came up with the suggestion. I am very happy to see that the many governments are now making use of our uh, suggestions. We are very happy. Yesterday, I had a press conference with the Belgium minister, uh, Minister uh, van der Straten, who said that the, they came up with a five-point plan uh, based on IES uh, uh, work, uh, which makes uh, perfect sense, and many uh, others. Now, what we want to do uh, is that the, what kind of uh, steps the consumers can take with the most effective, most effective, and practical uh, way. 
So we have we talked with our colleagues in, in commission uh, with Dite and uh, her uh, uh, colleagues. We came up uh, with what oil and gas we brought them uh, together, and we say how can the European citizens play their part, play their part to save money for themselves, to uh, reduce the reliance on Russian energy, and to help to achieve our climate uh, goals. So uh, we have uh, nine different uh, suggestions uh, here. And uh, we see that if those suggestions are implemented, and household, our numbers show, a household saves about close to 500 euros of family uh, 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 budget in a year. 500 euros. So, so do you save money? You at the same time uh, push Russia back, and you are on the front line with the Ukrainians against uh, Russia, and at the same time you have the uh, do, uh, reduce the uh, emissions. So how do we do that? They are very simple. They are very simple uh, measures: turning down of the heating, or using our air conditioners a bit more uh, uh, carefully. Increasing the uh, perhaps or implementing working from home to reduce the uh, travel uh, to work. If you were to travel to work, we would like to see uh, speed limits, especially in the highways, uh, 10 kilometers per hour or uh, uh, beyond. In many countries, we have seen in many cities, car-free Sundays. This helps a lot for many uh, reasons, uh, and this is uh, definitely a way of reducing uh, uh, oil uh, consumption, and also uh, public transport. Yesterday, uh, uh, Mr. Watts is here, I had a meeting about 10 uh, mayors uh, of uh, Europe, London, Barcelona, Warsaw, Oslo, I mean, this is the mayors will play a critical role here together with the trade unions and also uh, consumers. So making public transportation cheaper or for free is in fact more, more economic option to get oil or gas from Middle East or from Latin America and, and we have the same uh, effect uh, uh, here. Our numbers show that if we are to implement this simple, effective, practical steps by uh, the European citizens. For example, in terms of uh, oil, we save about 600,000 barrels per day of oil. This is an excellent news. In terms of natural gas, this simple, very simple uh, uh, action would save enough uh, natural gas equal to Nord Stream 1, the biggest pipeline coming to uh, bringing Russian gas to Europe, just with simple uh, issues, simple uh, steps. As I mentioned, the uh, thermostat is uh, one issue, insulation is uh, another one. Now, uh, we will be working and uh, trying to raise awareness uh, on the situation and the European uh, citizens working together with the European Commission and other uh, countries. But I am uh, delighted, to be honest with you, it's a, a positive surprise uh, to me when I asked my colleagues in our communication office this morning, so many people are following this event, so many journalists, many ministers, and the, the, uh, the civil society representatives are here. This is a very uh, encouraging sign. To finish, uh, dear colleagues, I mentioned that this is the first global energy crisis. Uh, we hit the, uh, the oil crisis in the 70s. And the oil crisis in the 70s not only lead a surge in inflation and also harm the economic growth, but it also gave a big boost in energy efficiency everywhere around the world, from transportation sector to households. I very much hope that the Europe will take the lead here, bringing energy efficiency through these uh, measures and also some regulatory measures 
not only voluntary, but regulatory uh, measures, put the energy efficiency at the top of their policy agenda when we want to push uh, Russian energy back out of uh, Europe. So I thank you very much again for all the ministers, uh, mayors, and the civil society representatives uh, joining this event, and many uh, colleagues who are uh, citizens following this uh, live stream. Over to you, Mr. Mubarak. Uh, many thanks, uh, Dr. Birol. And with that, we're going to turn to uh, Minister Termes of Luxembourg. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. So first, I want uh, to congratulate uh, Fatih Birol and his team for all the work uh, they did over the last uh, weeks. Uh, first, the analysis. This summer, there will be not enough oil on the world market when the driving season starts, unless we go for a big worldwide saving campaign and Europe must be a part of that. And next is gas. And even if we want to, be, to fill our gas storages for next winter, every cubic meter of gas which we save now helps already. So I think gas is also an immediate uh, story. Um, so where are we starting from? I think we start from uh, IEA's excellent 10 point on gas, 10 point on oil, but also uh, the conclusion from the IEA ministerial some weeks ago where we did not only uh, endorse uh, gas and oil plants, but we gave also an explicit mandate to IEA to continue to work. And the next step, uh, which I, I, I was basically instrumental at asking for, was uh, EU Commission should take a coordinating role. And therefore, thank you very much, General Director uh, Dieter Juli Jorgensen, that you have now moved Commission in this role also of coordinating uh, the European, uh, let's say, Europe as uh, broad. So what do we have on the table? And thank you for your nine points uh, paper. Um, I think we, we can make a difference, but um, what I think we need to discuss within us. If I'm a citizen and I'm running on a highway with 120 because I read the paper, and if all the other citizens double me because there is no speed limit, which has been brought down maybe by 10, I think I will not do it very long. And then there will not be a lot of impact. So I think that we need a buy-in. Sorry, I think we need a buy-in uh, from uh, the citizens. We need a buy-in from the cities and thank you for C40 to be present today. I think we need also the covenant of mayors. But I think we need also EU-wide measures like speed limitation, an EU-coordinated approach to home office, and an EU-coordinated approach, for example, for temperature control uh, in uh, the official uh, buildings. Um, and therefore, I think we need something like a scoreboard where citizens can go in, where companies can come in, uh, for example, Google and Co could work on the data centers, which is a very short term measure to save electricity and we saving electricity, we save uh, gas. And uh, if I have well understood in Brussels, uh, Commission is working on a new uh, additional uh, financial plan. Um, and I think we should do a link between uh, the scoreboard and then this financial plan. Uh, there will be two important political moments in Brussels. One is the repower document, which will then go uh, to an energy council, but also to the prime minister's meeting of end of May. So we need this campaign to be framed into this repower paper. And then we'll, there will be a very important second moment, which is uh, on the 27th of June, we as energy ministers meet and we will conclude our position on the new European Efficiency Directive and on the new European Renewable Directive. And that's also a moment of truth where we have basically to, to stick also uh, in the law uh, where basically where our mouth is today. So we have to, to live up to our ambition. And very importantly, there's a bit of a wrong messaging today that uh, diversification of gas is short term 
It is not because uh, an LNG terminal takes time and that renewables and efficiency would be long-term measures. That's, so we are not starting from scratch. We have governments who have uh, campaigns in place. We have governments who have measures in the buildings in place for building renovation. So I think we need also to say it's about diversification, but also efficiency and renewables in the short term. So that would be my message for today. Turn to Mr. Uh, State Secretary Gretchen from Germany. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And uh, um, also my big thank you to the IEA and the European Commission for setting up this uh, meeting and coming up with uh, the suggestions. I think uh, we are all uh, now in the same uh, type of uh, mindset. We know that uh, Russian atrocious war uh, uh, has changed the energy landscape fundamentally, and that will stay like that. We are now entering a phase of high fossil fuel energy prices, and that will last. And that means that uh, energy efficiency has a totally different value than uh, we thought. Energy savings uh, has a totally different uh, payback period. Um, uh, but it also means that uh, if we want to reduce our dependency from Russian energy imports um, and to be quick there, uh, energy uh, savings uh, are uh, the source we need to tap uh, the most. Now, what Fatih Birol and his colleagues have been writing up uh, is, of course, well known, and, and, and it's helpful to uh, remind everyone and ourselves again what needs to be done. And coming from a country which doesn't even have a speed limit yet, I know that this is... Uh, uh, something uh, that uh, is an absolute no-brainer, but sometimes politics don't work that way. Um, I think Claude made an important point that this needs to be more than just voluntary. Wherever needed, uh, the, the question is, what can we do in terms of regulatory terms so that this is something where everyone is participating and not only those who are thinking of the climate or uh, have um, uh, basically uh, the, the, the need to do it because of uh, um, lesser household incomes. So the regulatory discussion that we know also within Europe, but also in each member states uh, have uh, to to strengthen energy savings and energy efficiency uh, is back on the agenda. And, uh, and we uh, kind of had uh, a bit lost that drive in the past years. Um, the second thing I would like to note is um, if we look at the, the measures, uh, the nine points uh, that we have here, um, six are on oil and three are on gas, if I uh, counted correctly. Um, now, that is uh, relevant, of course, uh, because there are a lot of short-term savings when it comes to transport. Um, but when it comes to Russian dependency, the gas part is the more relevant one. So I think we also need to have a closer look what we can do in the short term to reduce our uh, uh, gas dependency and gas consumption. Um, and that uh, then also implies um, those things that can be done with little investments, like uh, smart thermostats or uh, um, uh, uh, maybe uh, putting a heat pump next to each gas boiler and have it as a hybrid system. So what is it? that also we as Europeans, we uh, as governments can push so that um, already by the end of this summer, we have uh, structurally reduced our gas uh, demand 
because uh, as uh, has been pointed out uh, before, every kilowatt hour counts in this context. And the third element is obviously that we need to have this as a joint exercise of governments through regulation, citizens through action, and companies. There is a lot of gas uh, uh, reduction potential uh, also when we look at companies. Uh, everyone who has been working on energy efficiency knows that there are uh, quite some potential uh, that uh, can be tapped uh, and uh, has payback periods of two to three years. And uh, typically that wasn't uh, pursued because um, it, it wasn't relevant when it comes to the big uh, uh, cost points of a, of, of a company. But I think we should be now, as just as we are looking at customers, also looking at companies and uh, um, coming up with uh, the idea that 10% um, reduction is always findable. If you look at uh, a company and if the CEO says, um, I want us to reduce our energy demand, our gas demand by 10% uh, within the next 12, maximum 18 months, uh, I assure you 90% of the companies will find that. Um, and uh, I think it's that type of uh, then also campaign that we need in uh, uh, the business uh, world um, so that this is a joint effort by European governments, European citizens and European companies to reduce uh, our energy imports from Russia and by the same time at the same time uh, thereby also uh, move forward on our uh, long-term uh, climate neutrality agenda because uh, this has been uh, forcefully uh, now strengthened uh, through this whole uh, uh, developments that we now need to move on when it comes to efficiency electrification and renewables uh, at a faster speed than we thought before thank you for your comments. And now I would like to turn to Minister Gelsler from Austria. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for inviting me to this crucial debate, which comes at also a crucial moment in time. Um, and I agree with the basic uh, notion of this debate. Everybody can play a part in um, getting us into a, a better state than we are in at the moment, a better state being the energy transition, whether they're young or old or from Bulgaria, Spain, Austria, or Germany. Um, and I also agree with what many of my pre speakers uh, before me have said, we also can play, uh, we also need to play a role in our respective roles, whether as citizens, whether as policymakers, whether as CEOs of companies, everybody needs to play a role in this common endeavor. And energy efficiency is a, is a no brainer in this respect, uh, but it has been an underestimated uh, source of a solution, I think, for, for many years. Um, and I, I say that it, it has always been a no-brainer, but it's even more so now a no-brainer because what, we've, what we see and feel in the situation we're in at the moment is um, that we are in a state of addiction, to, be, uh, to put it quite frankly. We're addicted to fossil fuels. And um, for decades, we've increased this addiction because if you, uh, if you had it once, you want it again and you want more. And um, with any addiction, it's not a good solution because we know we've ignored uh, the side effects, we've ignored the, ch the, the danger this uh, has to energy security, the damages to environment, to the climate, to our health. Um, and this is the addiction that we need to, this is the addiction that we need to get rid of. And so how do you get best rid of an addiction? <laughs> yeah. First of all, you realize that you have a problem. And I think there we have really moved fast uh, within the last couple of years, direct participation, young people who stood up and played their part. And I think for the last people who've doubted that this is a problem, uh, the Russian aggression in the Ukraine has made it blatantly clear that we have a problem in our dependency on fossil fuels and our dependency on, on Russian energy imports. 
Secondly, you need, um, if you want to get rid of an addiction, you need support, you need professional help. So um, the, all the scientists, the civil society, parents, students, the IA, and I really want to thank Fatih Pirol and all his team for the brilliant analysis you are doing, um, the concrete um, um, guidance that you're giving, such as in this document now, um, that will um, enable all of us to play our part on this move into a renewable, into an independent, into a free energy system in the energy transition. But it's clear this is not the process that um, can start, that will happen overnight. It's a process that we need to, to uh, consequently um, uh, stay on track. It's a process that we need to accelerate now, urgently, in the light of the, the circumstances. Um, and it's a process that needs to start now. So I very much agree with what um, Claude has said on not misunderstanding um, as short-term and long-term measures, because both of them need to start now, today, uh, in order to have an effect. So um, saving energy and energy efficiency is, um, is a key to that, because that works now. <laughs> that works from tomorrow. And so... Um, some of the measures that the IA proposes and the Commission proposes in this document are, uh, are obvious in this sense. Yeah, reducing temperature in rooms, using public transport in, uh, instead of the car. It doesn't only save money. Both of these measures save money, but in, uh, in, especially if you look at public transport, yeah, it, it's also a more convenient, a more, uh, a more um, uh, for me, I'd say also a more fun way to travel than standing in a traffic jam on the highway. So, but what I, um, what I want to underline, but all of these measures, um, they can be voluntary contributions and they're good if they are voluntary contributions, but they need political frameworks and political action to underpin them. So what we did in Austria to give you one example is that we introduced a flat rate ticket for all of public transport last year where public transport by far becomes the cheapest travel option in the country with three euro a day for all of public transport in all over the country. So it's not only the most climate, uh, climate friendly um, um, means of transport, it's also the cheapest and most efficient means of transport. Or we will introduce this year a program to uh, support especially low income households who often have household appliances um, that are very, very old and consume enormous amount of electricity and cannot afford to exchange them to support those in, 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 in this uh, change. We have introduced a program where low income households get their heating system exchange uh, refunded for up to 100%. So we basically pay low income households the, the, the change in heating system to get off gas, to get off oil uh, in, and to accelerate this, um, especially now. Um, but I think it's really crucial. We all need to play our part. We can play our parts as citizens, but we also need to play our parts as policymakers. Um, and I think it's, it's crucial that we uh, looking at what's happening in the European Union, that but we are discussing the Fit for 55 package and the legislative process has been mentioned before. Uh, we are discussing uh, the Repower EU plan. So um, we have good proposals on the table um, from the European Commission. So now as also as member states, we need to deliver on that. And um, so to accelerate this transition, to really make sure that um, we uh, also increase the ambition in energy efficiency to uh, increase the ambition in our uh, renewables take up uh, because this is the call of the day and this is the urgent thing to do. Um, so in this sense, um, that's, uh, that's, my, um, that's my role as a, as a policymaker and my contribution as a policymaker. And I think there we, um, there we really need to strong, forge strong alliances in order to make sure we actually really proceed on that because that's, um, that's the call of the day. And it has not only for climate reasons, but for the many reasons that, that have been mentioned in terms of energy security, in terms of not anymore funding a, um, a country that leads a brutal war of aggression in Europe. Um, thanks a lot for the work. And um, let's, let this be a call of action to all of us. Thanks a lot.
Many thanks, uh, Minister Gersler, and we know you had you have to leave uh, shortly, so we'd like to thank you for your participation in this discussion. And now from the national uh, level, we'd like to move on to the view from the local level. And with that, I'd like to turn it to Mr. Mark Watts from uh, C40s to give us the perspective from cities. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and indeed, uh, C40 Cities, which is uh, an organization of major cities across the world, we, we very strongly support uh, the IEA uh, and EU Commission Action Guide. Uh, and indeed, as Dr. Birrell mentioned just yesterday, uh, a group of C40 European mayors uh, met with, with Sharon Burrow and, and colleagues in trade unions across our cities, along with Dr. Birrell, to map out how C40 cities are going to work together both to, to prevent a fuel poverty crisis uh, in our cities, but also you use this moment when it's so crystal clear that the, the damage to uh, of our addiction to fossil fuels, as the, the minister just called it, uh, the damage that's causing both to our long-term future and people's immediate well-being. So at C40, we want to move decisively to make homes, offices, transport more energy efficient, but also invest so that we can free ourselves this decade, not only from Russian gas and oil and coal, but from all fossil fuels in Europe's major cities. And that's a, a plan that's been initially launched by, by London, Barcelona, Warsaw, Milan, Heidelberg, Oslo and Glasgow, but with many more cities uh, coming in behind it. it. Indeed, eliminating the wasteful use of energy uh, as set out in the, the action plan is very central to these plans. We're already seeing leadership uh, by city governments on this. Amsterdam, for example, is lowering the base temperature in all of the municipal buildings in the city by three degrees Celsius, which will save 15% of their gas consumption. We heard yesterday from the mayors of Barcelona and London, setting out how they're providing energy advice and education to enable vulnerable populations to identify those quick energy efficiency wins, as well as providing financial support uh, to ride through these rising prices. But also, as has been mentioned, to encourage wealthier residents to turn down their thermostats. I think this is particularly relevant. We heard from the IPCC recently that the 10% of wealthiest house households in the world cause 40% of carbon emissions. So this is really the moment for those of us in better off positions to reduce our energy consumption and enable the savings generated from that, the reduced demand for energy uh, to, to support vulnerable households. But I do want to say also, it's not just about uh, buildings, as, as Dr. Birrell said out, I think there's huge opportunity here in the transport sector. We're seeing cities massively extending uh, bike lanes, making it easier, uh, safer to cycle, to walk, lowering speed limits, 20 miles an hour, 25 kilometers an hour in, in many cities now, car free days, cheap public transport, expanding that public transport, although we do need to recognize here, there needs to be more subsidy for public transport, which has taken a really big hit with reduced ridership uh, during the pandemic. But fundamentally, this is the moment to massively accelerate investment in energy efficiency and renewable energy. So rather than one-off subsidies to help families who are struggling with rising bills, let, let's seize the opportunity to improve our long-term infrastructure. We think in C40 cities in Europe, we can increase the rate of retrofitting build, buildings from a, just 1% at the moment to 3% a year, focusing immediately on uh, those, th those homes where people are already in fuel po poverty or at risk of it. So retrofitting all of our social housing in the next few years. Um, double the floor area where we have heat pumps rather than gas or uh, coal powered central heating in the next five years. No new gas boiler installations. Lots of cities are already using their building regulation powers to do that, but let's make it right across uh, Europe. Uh, and increase renewable energy capacity in our cities at least 50% this decade. Those are all things we already knew we needed to do to hit on climate change targets. They're now much more imperative to free Europe from Russian energy, uh, but also to support people through these price uh, rises. And the final thing I just, just want to mention here is our analysis in C40 shows this stuff, this particularly the energy efficiency, the retrofitting of buildings, is the single biggest opportunity for job creation in European cities. Three times more jobs, good green unionized jobs can be created than investment in fossil gas and other fossil fuels. 
I think the IEA has set out a fantastic uh, series of plans, the 10 point plan on gas and oil also. Cities are really ready to deliver behind those plans. We do need more comprehensive funding and in some cases devolution of powers from national governments. We definitely support windfall tax on the super profits of the fossil fuel industry and I really welcome the chance for the national governments, city governments, unions and indeed civil society to work together here. Thanks very much for inviting us today. Thank you very much for your remarks. And uh, I'd like now to turn um, for the perspective from consumers. And for that, I invite uh, Monique Goyens, the Director General of BIUC, the European Consumers Organization. Thank you. Yes, good morning. And thank you very much for uh, in, including us in this very, very important uh, conversation. Um, totally agree. Uh, we all of us need to be part of the solution. And, and you already mentioned it. There is good news because by doing so, there is also a win for, for consumers, not only a financial monetary win, but also there is, um, of course, the fact that there will be also at the end of the day less pollution. It has not so often been mentioned, but it's also another win. Better health, less CO2 emissions. Uh, so it's not only about dependency. Um, and um, what uh, is very important is that uh, the fact that you can win out of it, and if you expect people to change behavior, uh, it must be not a source of frustration, and it must not be a source of punishment or feeling patronized. And the way that the tips are being mentioned here is really the, the way forward. It's you win out of it when you, when you adapt your behavior. I would, however, like to mention um, that I fully agree with the previous speakers saying that uh, you should not put the whole pressure on changing behavior on the shoulders of consumers, of individual people. There must be support, there must be a legal framework, there must be a nudging into the right direction. Um, now, I would like to concentrate now on the, on the, on the ideas that have been, on the, the proposals that have been uh, indicated in, in the report, in the paper. And I think that all ideas are no-brainers. Uh, they are the obvious good solutions. And there are other no-brainers, like, for example, taking a shower rather than a bath, taking shorter showers, insulating your water, hot water boilers or your, your heating pipes. Very low, low cost uh, investments can be done immediately today, tomorrow, and has immediate effect on your energy bill. Um, what is worrying to see, um, and I'm old enough to have been a teenager in the oil crisis in the 1970s, and all those tips were already known there. 50 years ago, half a century ago. And I'm so shocked that still we have to repeat those tips over and over again. Uh, so what prevents people? And I saw a question in, in, the, in the question and answer uh, bu um, button there. Why does it not happen? So what is happening there? What prevents people from making savings by a better behavior? Uh, so, and, and this is really where I really would like to draw the attention. Uh, on the need to take account of the following, if you want this campaign that would be launched or this information campaign to be uh, to be really um, uh, successful. Uh, first of all, um, energy is not really, can I use that language? Uh, it's not a sexy topic. People are not really interested in it. So you must make it sexy. You must make it attractive for them. Uh, so a, a, a plain information campaign is not enough. You need to add something on it. And a few things that I would mention, like to mention there is you have to go where the people are. Just a billboard is not enough. Just an advertising is not enough. Go into the schools, make an animation in the school. Go into the commercial centers, make an animation in the commercial centers with, with fun presentations of what you can do as a no-brainer. Talk to the frontline workers, the health workers that go into the houses, the social assistants, the social workers that go and meet certainly even the more vulnerable that can help just change the thermostat. Some people cannot really do that themselves or change the, the, the heating, uh, the, the temperature in your uh, water boiler. So really go where the people are and also never forget. And I mean, it's I, I'm, I'm working in that uh, to uh, topic since decades. Always work with people like they are and not like you would like them to be. Uh, and their behavioral science can really help you uh, to, to reach out to the people. And therefore, I think one of the best tips is to make the sustainable option fun and attractive. And maybe, uh, Mark, you could help uh, because you could make co competitions between neighborhoods and saying, uh, we have uh, who is the winning neighborhood in terms of energy saving this month? And you could even make a what? Game, it's gamification. It can really help. Peer pressure can help. My neighbor has made more savings than I did. So this is something that can really make a little bit more fun out of uh, saving energy. 
You need, of course, and it has already been mentioned, to eliminate barriers, get rid of red tape. It's a, it's a nightmare to try to install a heat pump in Brussels, uh, uh, administratively speaking. Get rid of all that um, or go to their homes and do it for them. Um, and also um, take leadership when it's needed. There are areas where voluntary restrictions don't work. If voluntary speed limitations would work, we would know by now. I think you need an obligation there, just need an obligation. I know it is sensitive in some countries, but I think to, to some extent, sometimes you need to take political leadership and you need to say, everybody, I mean, if you don't do it voluntarily, we will uh, impose it and we will enforce it. It's also important. And then, of course, um, last point, make it affordable, make energy uh, savings affordable, like, for example, make, like uh, Mrs. Gewessel has said, make public transport the cheapest option. Um, make, uh, make, make uh, for example, uh, um, uh, support people who come to, uh, to work by bike or by public transport. Provide fiscal measures in order to, to make it possible to invest into energy savings and so much more. So uh, it's really important to have accompanying measures. Information enough will not get the people into uh, into making that steps that are really no-brainers, but you just need to nudge them into uh, into doing that. And of course, the systemic changes, the ecosystem that has to change overall. Uh, but that is, of course, part of another conversation because uh, uh, we are speaking here about uh, everybody playing their part. But without the systemic changes, um, um, it will certainly not uh, be sufficient. And uh, talking to the companies, but also talking to public uh, sector is is key. Thank you very much. Uh, and I will now turn to um, Ms. Sharon Burrow from um, uh, the International Trade Union Confederation. I just wanted to recognize and welcome uh, Minister Eamon Ryan from Ireland. We'll get to you right after that. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Burrow. Uh, thank you indeed, uh, uh, Fadi, and uh, congratulations. This leadership is really important. To have the IEA and Mark to have the... Um, City, the C40 of mayors committed to these measures is a really big step forward because what we need is indeed leadership. I was struck by uh, indeed knew that uh, is new. We know the solutions, but we have to act. So we want to not um, take time, uh, too much time repeating what people have said, but to issue three challenges from the perspective of the trade unions. And we are determined to work in, in uh, uh, partnership with you on the nine point plan, but also with the C40 group of mayors in some of the really courageous initiatives that we talked about yesterday, Mark, because these are our biggest and, uh, and uh, best population centres make change if we're gonna see a real difference. But let me reduce it to three key areas of challenge. One is, we really have to look at everywhere we can measures to reduce energy poverty, including support for the most vulnerable consumers. This is not everybody. It's not the household. It's not the people who can take a little pain. It's the people who can't afford to pay the energy spike uh, and indeed the uh, commodity spike in prices and are really suffering risk of survival. And while we're focused on Europe today, this solidarity with the other points must also be extended wherever we can. And the others in a perfect and with the mayors to look at those areas outside of Europe where we can generate solidarity. But I would also say to you, and I put it to the mayors yesterday, we need to relook at some old uh, legislative Utilities used to be regulated. It doesn't matter at one level whether they're public or private. If these utilities are regulated, I agree it's easier if they're private and, uh, you know, we urge people to look at action there. But if they're regulated so that you can actually control the scope of prices between a price uh, rate minimum and in the private at a you have the capacity to control speculation. And speculation would be an even bigger enemy that's in you can't get it under control. Cities have some capacity. Uh, certainly governments have others. EU has even more power 
to coordinate such an action. The second area, as everyone has said, urgent investment in renewable energy. This is the fastest way to energy security and to climate neutrality. We know that it has, I said it yesterday, I'll keep saying it, for every 10 jobs in renewable energy, there are five to 10 in supply chains. If they're good jobs with just wages, union jobs, there's 30, 35 in the broader economy. That's how you build and secure economic security, as well as security for individuals in jobs for working people and their families. And of course, energy efficiency is the topic of today, and it is critical. We've known, as uh, you've already heard, for many years, I know when we started the debate on carbon trading, when I was still an Australian trade union leader, then energy efficiency was a big part of the mix. We did drop the ball, as uh, indeed our colleagues said, and we need to pick it up again fast. The nine-point plan is good, but can I say we also need the equivalent action from uh, indeed uh, industry and public institutions. And we need to do that with public procurement, with uh, corporate sector procurement, with procurement from any or other who have a capacity to look at what they're doing about indeed uh, the procurement of energy and the way in which we are using it. The nine point plan is sensible, but we can do the same in industrial settings. We can do the same in our public buildings. I think when you go to the program of commitment outlined yesterday by the mayors, marry it with the IA nine plan, then we have the dialogue at all levels. At local level, at city level, at European level, but indeed globally to make this a reality. It is about energy security. It's particularly about security in terms of gas for Europe and the rest of the world. But gas was never the long-term answer. So let's scale up our, uh, our commitment to renewables, to retrofitting, where indeed there are three times more jobs. And imagine what we could do for people in social housing for serious. Imagine what we could do if everybody met the test of regulation on, uh, on climate-friendly buildings. We would save on energy. We'd also provide not just more people living arrangements. We would also um, would meeting the, uh, the, the journey we have to take of more than 50% of action on climate by 2030. I congratulate you, Fatty, and the IEA. We stand ready to work with you both through the IEA Labor Council with employers and governments, but generally across the board with all actors. And wherever we can build dialogue tables, to make this a reality, to promote the actions people and industry giants take. Let's do it. Many thanks, um, Ms. Boro, for your remarks. And now I'm um, happy to turn it over to Minister Ryan from Ireland. Good morning, and I'm very glad to join this IEA meeting on, on this critical issue. Um, we've been meeting as ministers with in the IEA in Paris, um, and then in emergency sessions to further meetings to agree the release of oil stocks. And I think that was the correct thing to do in the supply crisis that we're facing because of this war in Ukraine. But thinking about it afterwards, I think Fatou, you were saying your analysis was that there might be a 3 million barrel a day shortfall on, on the global market in, in a market, correct Fatou, about 100 million barrels a day is, is the kind of daily demand, as I understand roughly. And I was just thinking about it afterwards, that yes, we were right to do that stock release to try and uh, overcome the immediate disruption, but surely on the efficiency side, if one was to put the case that if it is a global, which it is a global market uh, in oil, if, if, if we can't achieve at least a 3% improvement in efficiency just by measures that, that are, are not uh, hugely costly or, or hugely complex, surely that's that's an achievable ask to the public. Or maybe we would even say 5% as a, as a goal um, in a, on that oil side, achieving efficiency of that would, would more than compensate for the potential loss 
of uh, Russian oil to the market. And I, I know that's such an obvious point, but I think it bears repeating. And I think it's really critical that we do, as well as the supply side interventions through the likes of the IEA, that we also apply the efficiency um, measures because uh, we need maximum pressure. We need to do everything we can to try and shorten and stop this war. And being efficient and not being held to ransom on the energy markets is one of the most key and important tools. In gas, I, I think it is there, there are other complexities and other potential opportunities on the efficiency side. In a country like Ireland, where a lot of our gas is used for power generation, electricity, it's not just the quantity of energy use, it's the timing. The use of this opportunity to use efficiency measures to decrease our use at just at that peak period uh, between five and six and seven o'clock in the evening gives us the opportunity not to turn on the gas plants just to cope with that peak. That saves consumers money. It reduces the amount of gas that we buy from, from the market and, and therefore revenues going to the Russian government. Um, and it's a step in the efficiency direction where we need to go anyway. We need to use these smart technologies we have to help us in efficiency, the smart meters we have and other mechanisms to send signals and make it easy for the householder to be efficient, but critically to manage the demand in a time way as well as a use way to help us reduce the amount of gas. I'll be honest and have to say that we've been obviously engaged in this at home. I'm sure a lot of my colleagues, I see Leonora and Claude there and others, um, have already been engaged in some of this messaging. It is difficult. It's a very difficult political message. It's very difficult not to come across as someone who's telling the citizen what to do or is uh, uh, being seen as a kind of a mean Scrooge-like character. And, and that is why I think it's important we coordinate as much of these information campaigns and indeed the regulations to support energy efficiency at the international and in my mind at the European level. I look forward to us meeting as ministers in our upcoming Energy Council meetings and beyond, where I think we need to coordinate that response. So it's not just seen as an ineffective national response. What could we, a small country, do in this big wartime situation? But we acting collectively, uh, maybe have greater strength and also certainly overcome some of the political difficulties. I say that because I think the real crux on this is going to come next autumn and winter. We were lucky this winter, it was a relatively mild winter. Had it been a colder one, we might have even lower gas stocks than we would otherwise have. But we all know that the real hit is going to come on the energy side in the autumn, when the hedging of bills can no longer provide protection against the fivefold increase in gas prices, when we might face a colder winter with our gas stocks low and with people suffering from real fuel poverty. And that's a very difficult how you promote energy efficiency at the time when people are finding it hard to heat their homes is the real political challenge here. I think we have some time at the political level over these coming months to take what we're doing, but to coordinate and go further, and particularly in the efficiency side, to work on a European, cross-European approach as part of this war effort, but also preparing and getting ready for an autumn and winter that could be difficult. And the more attention we provide to efficiency in that time, in, in that process, the better in my mind. Thank you. You're on mute. Um, we're getting a lot of interest from the media here, and I'm very conscious of time, but I do want to address a number of a few questions and um, that we are getting. Uh, so the first one is for the European Commission. Um, do you envision, and this question is from Christian Erndy from ENDS Europe, uh, do you envision concrete regulatory energy efficiency measures for EU citizens, such as EU-wide speed limits, for instance, in the upcoming Repower EU. Uh, and then um, if I may just ask the second uh, question uh, to both Minister Ryan and Minister Termis, um, energy efficiency is a no-brainer, uh, says the questioner for Pierre Denry from Aurora. Um, how come no coordinated measures have been implemented since March when our 10-point plan was uh, released? What are the barriers to action? So perhaps the first question um, to the uh, European Commission. 
Thank you very much, Dad, and thank you to all the speakers for the really uh, interesting and important points uh, made over this last hour. So we have already a strong European regulatory common framework on energy efficiency. Um, as part of our Green Deal and Fit for 55, we've strengthened it. And so there's a lot out there that are structural interventions and regulation in the markets to make sure that we are as energy efficient as we can be in our industry, in our homes, in the public sector, there's a key role. So that is there. Then uh, we need to distinguish between those structural energy efficiency changes and what is the immediate energy savings. And what we are looking at in addition to the energy efficiency regulatory uh, uh, frameworks and actions is what can you and I and everyone individually do immediately to save energy. And there's a lot we can do that doesn't have to wait for the time it takes to regulate. And um, I think um, um, Iman Ryan made a very good point in the sense of when we go out there and say what can be done, it's not about us telling people what to do uh, and we try to avoid that it comes across as such. It is really creating a, a set of options of things that can be done quickly and immediately and really have an impact without waiting for regulation, without waiting for the government to step in, but what can everyone do? Um, in terms of regulating, you mentioned speed limits, for example. Um, what we need to be aware, and now I'm being boring and legal and bureaucratic, but it is that some of these issues are regulated at national or even at local level. And so we can't come in and say, from now on, uh, this, is, this is what we do in Europe. But what we can do is to talk about it, to discuss it, to um, clarify, and this is what um, Fatih Birol and the International Energy Agency have done, really what can you do and what's the impact of what you do in your daily life? And that's where, where it's important, in addition to the regulatory framework that is, that is in the process of being strengthened as fast as we can. Thank you. Thank you, and I'll ask the same question first to Minister Termis. So uh, in your mind, why um, have there been no coordinated measures on energy efficiency, for instance? What are the barriers to action? Um, I think we are acting at national level. Um, in Luxembourg, for example, we, we are massively now promoting this kind of dual heat pump. So you have an existing gas and oil, you put a heat pump uh, close to it, you can save 70, 80% of your gas and oil. And, and like we have free public transport in Luxembourg for the whole country. So I think we are doing at national level what we can do, but we must be aware that the figures behind the world oil market, the figures behind Europe's dependence on gas, that is big figures. This is big volumes. So you cannot get to the volumes we need if we don't do it in a coordinated way. And therefore I'm so happy that we got to the meeting today. And from here on, I think we now must uh, be uh, courageous we must really go to issues like a coordinated EU speed limits, coordinated EU home office, coordinated EU all government buildings will be temperature controlled, uh, and so on and so on. Otherwise, we don't get the volumes. And then uh, you, you do a campaign and it is not successful and that is not good in politics. So, uh, and therefore, before doing a European-wide or an IEA-wide campaign, we must work on the fundamentals, on, on what is a good language, what is the best possible regulation. But because communication campaigns are powerful, but they are risky, because if you get the message wrong, <laughs> you, 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 you get nowhere, and then you are burned. Uh, for, for you, you burn the ground, the, the confidence of citizens for some years. So that's the reason why we don't yet have a new or an IEA coordinated uh, campaign, but the meeting today will help us to get where we need to go. Many thanks. And, and to Minister Ryan, the same question on energy efficiency, if it's such a no-brainer, um, what have been the barriers to action in your mind? I don't know if this is a barrier, but I think the political system, if you look across Europe and other countries, have focused first on protecting people from fuel poverty. There's been a lot of work done in most European countries in introducing measures 
that help those most at risk. And some of them controversial, some of them advised against, you know, some of the tax cuts or excise cuts are also direct, but also very good direct supports for households. And I think it was, it was understandable and appropriate for the political system to focus on that first, to, to as Claude says, to try and keep the public with us in, in this very, very difficult situation. And secondly, I think the political focus has been on some of the supply issues. The IEA, rightly, and I think um, Se uh, Secretary of State in the US, Grant Home, did a very good job in bringing us together to show a coordinated yeah. response on the supply side. And those two measures took a lot of political focus and a lot of political energy and time. And I think now is the time for the efficiency measures, exactly as Claude has set out in a coordinated way. And, and I think um, we have some time. I mean, a lot of countries are already starting some of those advertising campaigns. Germany, Belgium, as I understand, we will start our own campaign this weekend. But to go further and to really um, deliver kind of strong efficiency regulations, the sort of ones Claude mentioned, I think it may take some months. And I don't think that's a problem because the real efficiency challenge, the war has to start in the autumn and the winter when our energy use uh, multiplies. And, and so I think getting it right in that coordinated way in the next few months should be our political focus. Our first focus was on financial supports, on oil supplies, but now I think it has to go on to efficiency. And I think the European Commission and the European Union and the Council together is the best way of doing it, as Claude says, so we can show strength and volume and, uh, and real common commitment, which I think overcomes what is a difficult political message to deliver. So you don't come across as telling people what to do. You're showing them how we can work together to help in this difficult time. Many thanks for your answer. And uh, the last question will go to Dr. Birol, who will also close our meeting. And the question is from El Emily Gostin from the Times of London. Question to you is, how do you respond to the UK government saying there is absolutely no need to apply the guidance in the UK regarding the 10 point plan uh, the IEA released on reducing uh, oil use? Dr. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think this is a very timely information because on Monday, I will be in London uh, meeting the uh, government officials, including the ministers, it is speaking on this subject at the House of uh, Lords and House of Commons, exactly this issue. I think no country, but no country is immune to the first uh, the global energy crisis we are uh, entering. They may take this decision or uh, that decision, they may take this measure or that measure. I believe UK government we will also take some measures and the recent uh, energy strategy they have published is I think a good step in the right uh, direction. So uh, dear colleagues, if I say a, a, a few things to finish, we have a golden opportunity in fact uh, in front of us through voluntary and regulatory measures, we can make energy efficiency a top priority for the policy making in Europe. There is a lot of discussion in Europe and elsewhere to find a solution to this problem, but there is perhaps a disproportion and this focuses on the supply side of the equation. We have to look at the supply side as well, but the demand side efficiency is very important. Uh, I am very uh, uh, thankful to uh, my colleagues who have been working on this issue, including my colleague Stephanie Bukert, who is the uh, mastermind uh, behind this uh, work, but also think Many thanks to European Commission, uh, 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 Madam Director General uh, uh, Dite. We are at your disposal whenever you need us. We are there to uh, support you. So, uh, dear colleagues, this is a 24th of February. Uh, in my view, was a historical turning point in the Europe's energy policy making, and uh, I believe uh, more and more that this uh, the turning point will be in the right direction. Uh, for a more uh, secure, cleaner European energy future. And International Energy Agency will do everything it can in order to support uh, this uh, process. I thank uh, you all uh, very much, the ministers, uh, trade unionists, uh, mayors, uh, and the business uh, and the uh, consumer uh, representatives uh, here. 
and uh, we will be back uh, again uh, with different uh, measures, different ideas, and different uh, projects. Very many thanks, and we wish you uh, all the best, especially to those uh, over 50,000 people who are following uh, this uh, uh, debate, which makes me very happy to journalists and uh, all others. Very many thanks to all of you from the uh, IE headquarters in Paris. Thank you. Thank you.